Hey, I'm Darlene, and you're watching a detailed step-by-step -step tutorial, Quarantine Edition. Since art supplies may be hard to come by during this time, use whatever tools that you have, or you can even make your own. I'm using a dollar store pencil, a tissue, a homemade blending stump, and a kneadable eraser, which you can learn how to make in my other video. Let's begin. Lightly draw or trace a circle for the eyeball. I'm hovering my hand over the page and making circular motions. Once I feel confident, I lower my hand until the pencil contacts the page. It doesn't have to be perfect because we're only going to use it minimally during the construction process of the eye, and then we'll erase it completely. If you're wondering, my circle is 6 centimeters in diameter. Draw a small bump or cornea in the direction you want the eye to face. I want mine to face the right, so I'll draw mine on the right side. In terms of sizing, the cornea's length is roughly the same length as the eyeball's radius. Draw the iris by creating an oval which touches the top and bottom of the cornea. Make sure your line work is very light, so you can make changes easily. Inside the iris, draw a narrow oval for the pupil. Erase part of the eyeball outline that crosses through the iris. Now let's draw the eyelids. Starting roughly from the center of the eyeball, lightly draw a curved line for the top eyelid. It can cover part of your iris or expose it completely. Then wrap the eyelid around the other side of your eyeball. To draw the bottom lid, create a curve where the two eyelids meet, and then draw toward the bottom of your iris. Usually when our eyes are open, the iris is most exposed at the bottom rather than the top. So if you want to draw narrow eyes, keep that in mind. Right above the top eyelid, draw the eyelid crease. You can use the eyelid shape as a reference. Draw your stroke beyond the eyeball, and then connect your stroke to the eyelid using a slight curve. In terms of the angle, you can use the eyeball shape for reference. To complete the bottom lid, I'm drawing a stroke that goes almost straight down, but you can angle it in or out if you want. Now if you wrap the eyelid skin very close to the eyeball, you can get a bulging eye effect. You can also add wrinkles at the corner of the eye or at the end of the eyelid crease if you want. I'm actually going to make the eyelid curve out a little bit more. This is optional. You can do whatever you think looks good. Once you're done, erase the circle guideline and parts of the iris that fall outside the opening of the eye. Now let's figure out where to draw the eyebrow. Draw a very faint vertical line at the end of your eye to mark a rough boundary for the tail of your eyebrow. Draw another line from the cornea's edge for the eyebrow arch. And then a line that roughly angles out from the eye like so for the beginning of the eyebrow. Eyebrows come in all shapes and sizes, so don't worry too much about this part. They're just rough guidelines. Now that we have three guidelines in place, we can draw the eyebrow more easily. You can draw your eyebrow as high or as low as you like. I'm going to start in this section, curving my pencil stroke down while using my guideline as a rough boundary. Remember to keep your pencil strokes extremely light so that your outline won't show through later. Draw your eyebrow as thick as you'd like. Continue your stroke upward and toward the line which marks where the eyebrow will arch. Choose where you want the eyebrow's tail to be, and then draw toward the arch, connecting all your outlines together into a unified eyebrow shape. Once you're happy with the shape, erase the three guidelines. Now for the fun part. Let's add some highlights in the eye. 
Highlights are the brightest area of a drawing. A highlight can be from a nearby window or any light source. Here are a few example shapes. These shapes are all curved because the eyeball is curved, so a square-shaped window might look like this, and a rectangular one like this. You can come up with your own shapes and stretch them across the eyeball, covering as much or as little space as you like. If you want, you can add some obstructions in the highlight, like the silhouette of a person standing in front of the window, or some curtains. You can even create a gradient across your highlight to indicate a difference in light intensity. Once your highlights are drawn, erase any lines that cross through them, cleaning them up. I'm using my kneaded eraser for this, just rolling the end till it's pointy and then dabbing the graphite away. Here's a close-up. Throughout the drawing process, try to keep your highlights as clean as possible so they can stand out. You can even flatten your eraser to work along an edge. Time for some shading. Let's start with the pupil, shading it really dark because it's actually a hole in the iris. Next, we'll shade the iris. Remember to be very careful around the highlights because we want to keep their edges crisp. You can shade as light or as dark as you want without going darker than the pupil. You can blend the iris now using a tissue or blending stump so it looks more smooth before moving on to the next step or even skip the blending process if you want. I'm going to blend my entire drawing at the end to keep the video short, but I highly recommend blending as you go because it's a lot easier that way and you can avoid smearing your work during the process. Here's the blending process that I like to follow. I shade the light values, blend it, then add shadows. And I try to blend just the shadows so I don't smear the darker graphite into the lighter areas. Then finally, I add details. If I need to do any blending after the details are added, I blend around them, being very careful not to blur or smudge my detail work. Once detail work is smudged, it may be difficult to recover. Okay, moving on. If your imaginary light source comes from above, you'll want to shade the top of your iris a little bit darker because the iris shape is concave. So the top is actually facing away from the light, whereas the bottom of the iris faces toward the light. As I work my way down, I'm applying less pressure to get a gradient as the concave iris shape starts curving or facing toward the light. You can shade the very top of the iris a little bit darker to account for cast shadows from the eyelid. Something I like to do is shade the rim of my iris darker than the iris body to give it more contrast but that's completely up to you. This large highlight is too overpowering for my liking, so I'm going to make it more subtle by shading the lower part, making it gradually lighter toward the top, just like the example that I showed you earlier. When you finish shading the iris, make sure that the outline of each highlight has blended into the surrounding area, 
As you can see here, the outline is still visible, which doesn't look very realistic. I'm using my kneaded eraser once again to dab right along it, lifting the graphite away little by little, just enough to make the outline disappear. Again, you can make your very own kneadable eraser at home. Check the video description for that tutorial. Alright, so that was the simple and quick version for shading an iris. This next part is optional, but to make the iris look more interesting, more detailed, you can add some fine details such as lines that stretch outward from the center. Use your pencil and eraser to render these lines. If you want to draw straight lines, you can flatten your kneaded eraser and then just press and lift the graphite away, or rub gently. If you curve your lines close to the pupil, the hole inside the iris, you can make it look more 3D. Try to angle or space out some of your lines randomly and vary the thickness to make them look more natural. As an alternative, you can draw squiggly shapes if you prefer. Mold a pointier tip for your eraser to increase your precision. I'm drawing this example on the same iris, but I recommend that you select only one style or somehow marry the two. A solid eraser will work too, just make sure that it's pointy enough. You can cut the eraser to make it as pointy as you need it to be. It's good to overlap the squiggles too. After that, use your pencil to darken some of the spaces in between your squiggles to add some depth and contrast. These lines and squiggles are all part of the iris, so we'll need to shade them similarly to how the iris was shaded before they were added. Remember how we shaded the top of the iris? I'm doing that again, except this time, lighter. Oh, and shade around the outside of your pupil if you want the area to appear deeper. Anyways, that's the detailed version of an iris, but you can of course stick with the simple version. Let's shade the eye whites now. They're called eye whites, but they're not exactly white, so don't be afraid to shade them. Refer to your light source again. Let's subtly shade the eyeball lightest where it faces the light, and darker where it faces away. To prevent scratchy looking strokes, Scribble off to the side to make your pencil blunt before you shade. If you're a beginner, you might find it easier to shade using curved strokes instead of straight ones to prevent the eyeball from looking flat. To shade very smoothly, try to keep pencil strokes close together to eliminate gaps. Since our light source comes from above and the eyelid sticks out in front of the eyeball, we'll get a cast shadow right below it. So let's go along the top part of our eyeball and shade it slightly to account for that detail. I'm feathering out the shading as I work down, so the shadow's edge appears soft. There's another part that we need to shade. The eyeball is a round shape, so as the lower part curves away from the light, it will also need to be shaded darker. While we're here, I'm just going to shade the rim of the iris a little bit more to soften the edge. You may want to blend your eyeball before moving on to the next step. 
Let's add some veins in the eyeball by sharpening our pencil and drawing them in very, very faintly. Try to make your veins even lighter as they reach toward the iris. I'm going to shade along the top eyelid now. Right where the eyelid crease is, create a gradual value change from dark to light as we work our way down. This will make the skin actually look as though it's creased. After that, let's shade this lower section of the eyelid because it curves away from the main light source. Now let's shade the rest of the eyelid, leaving this part the lightest because it faces the imaginary light source directly. I'm using strokes that follow the contour of the skin. This is called contour shading. If you vary your stroke pressure, making some strokes darker, you can give the skin a more realistic texture. You can even throw in a few subtle strokes that go in random directions to mimic the fine lines and wrinkles of the skin. For the bottom lid, I'm creating a narrow ridge along the top using a very faint outline. And then, let's shade right below that line. Aside from contouring, you can also try the shading technique called circulism. It's just a bunch of overlapping circular shapes, which are great for shading skin textures. To draw an eye pouch or a bag under the eye, shade along the bottom of the eye bag to make it look as though the skin puffs outward. To make it subtle, keep the shadows nice and light. Let's shade all the other areas and then move on to the eyelashes. Starting at the crease, I'm going to shade lighter as I work away from it, as the skin curves and turns toward the light. Over here, let's shade pretty dark to make the inner part of the eye look deep or hollow. And then as we work our way down and to the right, let's gradually lighten our strokes as the skin starts to curve again toward the light. You'll notice that as I shade around areas like the eyelid, the outline conveniently starts to blend in or disappear, so I don't have to erase it. The cornea's outline will also disappear if I continue to shade downward, but I forgot to do that here, so you can continue shading the surrounding skin beyond the cornea if you like. Continue shading above the crease, making your strokes lighter as you work your way up. Above this, I'm going to again consider the light source, which areas face it directly and which areas face away. You can shade the brow area however you want to define a brow shape that you prefer. 
If you want to learn more about shading, please refer to my tutorial in the card or in the description. All right, it's eyelash time. But before we draw any hair, I'd suggest that you blend your shading now because it'll be quite difficult to blend around all the individual lashes. To draw lashes, we'll need to sharpen our pencil. I'm working with a mechanical pencil, so it's already quite sharp. Practice drawing eyelash shapes until your strokes become pretty consistent. Your eyelashes can curve more or less, just make sure the end of the eyelash is tapered. You can use flicking motions to achieve that effect. Let's start at the top eyelid, creating lashes that grow out from the bottom edge. If you're struggling with drawing smooth curves, it may help to rotate the paper. Here's a tip. Avoid drawing too many lashes that run parallel to each other. If you taper them together, you can create more natural looking lashes that look less patterned. There are a few things that you can do to make your lashes look more unique and random, such as vary the length, spacing, or amount that they curve. If a lash isn't dark, thick, or long enough for your liking, you can always go over the same pencil stroke again. With that in mind, continue along until you reach the corner of the eye. Lashes located near the corner of the eye are usually shorter, thinner, and therefore appear lighter. Add some lashes along the other side of the eyelid. As you work your way down, make them shorter and lighter. Now let's move on to the lower set of lashes while using the ridge line as a reference. I like to draw these much shorter and more spread out. You can draw lighter than mine if you want a more subtle appearance. Instead of drawing them all along the ridge like this, let's also draw a bunch of hairs that grow a bit lower. Again, try to avoid obvious patterns. You can draw lashes on their own, join them at the ends, or cross them over one another. You can also vary the hair spacing, length, and thickness. Let's not forget to draw lashes along the other side of the eyelid. Once you're satisfied, it's time to work on the eyebrow. The hair growth pattern might seem confusing, but it's easier once we break it down. We can draw a line through the eyebrow to separate it into two zones. I've drawn a line from the top right to the far left. This boundary line is different for everyone because there are so many different types of eyebrows. I'm going to call this zone 1 and 2. In zone 1, we're going to draw hairs that point up, 
and then as we work toward the left, they'll point more toward the tail end of the eyebrow. In zone two, the hairs mostly point in a downward direction toward the tail of the eyebrow. Okay, let's draw a faint boundary line for our eyebrow to separate the two zones using short disconnected pencil strokes because we don't want this line to show through in the end. Using light strokes, roughly draw hairs in zone one while staying within the boundaries. As you work toward the left, curve and angle the hairs so they point more toward the tail of your eyebrow. We're going to blend this out in a second so it doesn't have to be perfect. Then draw a few faint hairs in zone two without crossing over into zone one. I'm going to blend the eyebrow using a regular facial tissue wrapped around my finger. Blend from right to left, basically in the general direction that the hairs are pointing. Now we have a base layer of cast shadows, and they can also act as subtle hair. Now we're going to draw the final hair, which we won't blend. I'm going to draw them dark, but you can adjust the pressure based on your preference. As I draw, I'm tapering two or more hairs together so they don't look bushy. Try rotating your sketchbook if you find these strokes difficult to draw. You can add some unruly hairs over here that point toward the right. Draw these ones thinner and lighter though. Once you're done with zone one, move up to zone two, drawing hair that points down toward the left. Where the hair from both zones meet, I like to taper them like this instead of crossing them over each other because I think it looks less messy, but feel free to experiment with both. If this hand movement from right to left is a challenge, you can flick your pencil in the opposite direction as well. It's actually better because we'll need these hairs to fade out along the top edge of the eyebrow. Avoid drawing straight lines and instead curve your stroke even just slightly. Okay, so we can actually get the eyebrow to look 3D by making specific hairs darker. This could be a whole topic of its own, so let's keep it simple. The hair right below zone two are covered in shadow because when they meet with the hair above, they curve outward and are therefore facing away from my light source. If we shade them darker, we can give the eyebrow more dimension, more depth. I'm just going along each hair in that zone and making them a bit darker.
Now there's a clear difference in value between the two zones, making the hairs point out toward the viewer instead of appearing flat on the page. Here's a before and after to show how a small detail can make a big difference. By now, our faint eyebrow outline should no longer be visible. If it is, erase the outline carefully or draw additional hair to cover it up. Let's go around the edges and add some lighter hair and or unruly hair. I'm just going to shade a slight cast shadow right below the eyebrow. If you're enjoying this tutorial so far, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more detailed drawing tutorials. Okay, I think that's enough for the eyebrow. To make the eye look wet, we can add water along the bottom of our eyeball. Grab your kneaded eraser, flatten it and erase a thin space along the eyeball. If the line of water doesn't show up well, shade around it very slightly. The increased contrast will bring it out. You can roll the end of your eraser to a point to erase more precisely or to erase a round shape. If you've already blended your drawing throughout the tutorial or you're not interested in blending, please skip to the section on how to make the drawing pop. Okay, before blending, we want to make sure that our shading is as smooth as possible. So that means making sure that there are no gaps between our strokes and that any blotchy areas are reduced to the best of our ability. Once you're ready, let's blend the entire drawing one area at a time. If you also waited to blend at the very end, this does require a bit of patience. I'm going to use my homemade blending stump, which you can learn how to make by clicking the link in the card or description. It's just a tightly rolled up piece of paper. I'll start in the iris, blending the lightest areas first, so I don't get dark smear marks everywhere. I'm using the lightest amount of pressure and I'm barely touching the paper. So this is where patience comes into play. Blend slowly and patiently. You may need to go over the same spot a few times to even see a difference. If your work starts to become dirty because the blending stump is transferring too much graphite onto the page, rotate the stump to a cleaner spot. Once you're finished blending light zones, move on to slightly darker areas and then the darkest areas, but not the other way around, to avoid unwanted smudges. Be careful not to blend over any edges that you want looking crisp and sharp. When the blending stump becomes too dirty, you can clean it using a bit of medium grit sandpaper, a nail filer, or even rub it over a brick or cement pavement. Just make sure that it's clean and flat. Gently blend the rest of your drawing. You can even use the side of your blending stump to cover a larger surface area. Instead of a blending stump, you can also use a piece of facial tissue or toilet paper. Just fold it over twice and then fold it into a triangle several times until you get a pointy end. The tissue should now be pointy enough to blend in small spaces. If you need it to be even pointier, try folding it more tightly. I like to blend out the veins to make them look more subtle. Once your tissue is too dirty, unravel it and fold it again using a clean spot or rotate it to a cleaner spot and then continue blending.
In large areas of your drawing, such as this, you may find it very difficult and time-consuming to shade with such a small point. What we can do here instead is wrap the tissue around the tip of our finger and very gently swipe the area from the lightest to the darkest zone. But please be very careful not to smear any surrounding details. If you need to do it a second time, make sure you find a clean spot on the tissue first. To blend the crease, follow along the curve without going any further. Remember to blend from a light area into a darker one. When blending around areas like this that are surrounded by dark shading and detail work like the eyelashes, you can use the very tip of your finger or use a smaller finger like your pinky to better control where the tissue actually touches. This is what I meant when I said it's a lot easier to blend as you go along, blending in between the layers as you shade, especially before adding detail work. After all this blending, you'll notice that the tissue may have made your drawing a little lighter, especially the dark shadow areas. We can go over those later to darken them up. If the drawing isn't smooth enough for you, continue blending until you're satisfied. If you have any blotchy areas to fix, you can actually use a dirty blending tool to fill those areas in while blending it at the same time. And again, you can remove excess graphite by dabbing it with your kneaded eraser, gently. This is how I get rid of blotchy areas to make the drawing look even smoother. Alright, so we covered this earlier, but if you still have a visible outline around your cornea and you just can't erase it because it looks weird without the outline, you can make it blend in by shading the skin beyond it, just enough to make the outline disappear. I do need to shade over the eyelashes very slightly, but it's a good opportunity to show you how I'd blend around those details without making the eyelashes look blurry. Fold your tissue into a pointy shape again, and then carefully blend around each and every eyelash using very little pressure. If there's a really tight spot that you need to get into, you can fold your tissue using less layers and making it tighter, or you can blend the area with your sharpened pencil, basically filling in any white dots or valleys on the paper surface. As you blend, follow the direction of each eyelash, being very careful not to smudge them. Fold your tissue again using a clean spot when you need to move to a lighter zone. When the tissue becomes too dirty, you can also just rotate it to a cleaner spot. Now the cornea's outline is no longer visible, since it has blended into the background. If your drawing doesn't pop enough, try cleaning up the brightest part of each highlight using your eraser, and or making the darkest areas of your drawing even darker. Or you can add more detail to the iris to make it stand out more, like the example that I showed you earlier. If you missed the explanation for that part, you can go back using the timestamps in the video description. Here's an added detail. If you want to draw fine wrinkles across the skin like I did along the top eyelid, pinch your kneaded eraser flat and then press it gently along the eyelid, lifting very tiny amounts of graphite. Space them out somewhat randomly and change the angle if you want. I hope this tutorial was helpful. If you have any questions, leave them down below. For more detailed drawing tutorials, subscribe and hit that bell icon. I hope you guys stay safe and are doing well. Thanks for watching.